Um, Speaking of important, next is um, National Blend version 2.0 with David Myrick and uh, David Rudak from MDL. So, David, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, considering we're running a little bit behind, I'm going to give just a brief high-level overview of what is the plan changes with um, Blend version 2.0. Um, and then we're going to dive into a couple of the new um, functionalities of version 2.0. Dave Rudak is going to talk about a product that was developed to support um, oceanic winds in the weather service. And then Tom Hamill is with us on the line from Boulder. Um, he's going to do a deep dive into the new POP12 and QPF methodologies that will be implemented in the blend. I'm not going to take any time to explain this. We all know this is a multi-year, um, multi-version project over the next few years. Um, Version 1 was implemented in January. Um, code was handed off for version 2 very quickly in June. I'll go over the new content in a moment for version 2. We're still on track for a late September implementation. I was just talking with Becky this morning. Uh, the version that adds version 2 to AWIPS um, started rolling out this week. So hopefully around the time when this thing goes live, everybody will have it in AWIPS. Um, Tom is going to talk about some of the changes out of the POP12 and QPF, and we'll be doing an upgrade to those this winter. And then a larger implementation, version 3.0, is scheduled for next summer. Um, this spreadsheet gives a very high-level overview of what is currently in production for NBM version 1. We have 10 weather elements uh, based off of five different model inputs. And the Cs all stand for the CONUS domain. In version 2, what have we changed? Um, we've added the NAM and the NAM nest for the, um, the CONUS blend. We've extended the output from day 7 to day 10. Um, we've added two new elements that Tom will be talking about a little bit later. Um, there were some issues that were identified in the wind speed product in version 1.0. It was running a little high. Um, that's been calibrated and improved in version 2.0. And this is also the version that introduces the new unified terrain. Um, in addition, we've taken what was built for the CONUS and expanded it so that it now covers the Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico NDFD domains. And we've also added this oceanic wind product that uh, Dave Rudak will speak to in a moment. This is what the spreadsheet now looks like um, for version 2.0. We're up to 12 elements and a larger set of models that are used, and the, the letters are indicative of which models are used for which domains. I'll leave that up for a moment, but for the sake of time, I'm going to keep, move, keep going. Um, in terms of you know, the grids that we'll be disseminating and grid durations, uh, version 1 is kind of that middle column. The biggest change to version 2 is getting the, the guidance out to day 10, and the addition of the QPF and POP12 grids um, from the work that Tom Hamels um, did. As well, um, the timing of NBM version 2.0 will be approximately an hour and 40 minutes earlier than the current delivery time. Um, this was due to um, some time savings we found when some of the models were coming in. Also, the timing for blend version 1 was uh, it was waiting for some European data that's uh, not being used in the blend, so we were able to trim some time there. The group at MDL that's been putting together the viewer, um, they've done some changes over the summer. They've added the Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico domains. And they're a week or two away from releasing an NDFD oceanic grid domain viewer uh, to be able to look at the oceanic winds. They also moved the website, so those that haven't, make sure you update your bookmarks to this new location. That happened about a month and a half ago. And before I turn things over to Dave Rudak, I just you know I want to reemphasize everything is on track for version 2.0. Um, we do have our dependencies. We're dependent on uh, the Irma upgrade. Um, we need the Hawaii and Puerto Rico Irma grids for calibration. Uh, this also introduces that unified terrain over the CONUS. Uh, the way that that gets into the Irma is through the model smart Inits that the Irma uses for the first guess. That's how the terrain is built in. And then the NBM version 2.0 upgrade has been bundled with an upgrade to GMOS and EKDMOS. And those upgrades um, include adding the unified terrain, as well as some um, minor expansions to the area that we're disseminating for data for Alaska. 
This allows the uh, national blend to be produced over the entire basin for APRFC and the offshore marine zones. Um, it's still disseminated on the exact same grids. It's just the clip is, is bigger, so that won't cause any dissemination issues. So before I turn it over to Dave, are there any high-level NBM version 2 questions? Okay. So, so Dave, this is Andy. Um, you, you, you I really do appreciate all the effort you've made to both shepherd this and also communicate. I mean, you, you've, you've done a great job in sharing information with everybody. So let me ask you my $100 question. What keeps you up at night? <laughs> I mean, what, what critical thing is sort of bothering you right now that we have to really watch out for? Let me think about that for 10 minutes, and when Dave is done, I'll, I'll respond at the end of this section. All right, I guess uh, that's a great segue. So, <laughs> <laughs> lots of you're keep, you're lots keeping of Dave things. up at night? No, not at all. No, I, I, I sleep quite soundly, thank you. Um, so I, I'm going to discuss a, a method for generating blended percentile oceanic wind speed grids. That's quite a mouthful over here. Uh, I, was, I am working with Yoon Fen and uh, Robert James um, on this project, as well as other projects in the blend. So I'll move forward over here. So just to give you some spatial perspective over here, as well as some of the uh, responsibilities of other offices and centers of what we're talking about. It's, 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 I'm getting a little feedback. It's, it's quite an expansive domain, and uh, basically what you're looking at in the red over there, which is pretty much coincident with the NDFD domain, is, is, is quite a large area. Mm -hmm. It overlaps uh, OPC merge zones, high sea forecast zones, coastal forecast zones, offshore. Um, so there, there's a lot. So when we started out in this project, we uh, were brainstorming uh, perhaps who to approach first. Well, uh, it seems like OPC takes care of a lot of this, this area, extra tropical area. So in, in being there also close by and we can meet face to face, it might be a good idea to, uh, to meet up with them. So we did that sometime in early March. Um, and you should also please keep in mind that what Dave was talking about, version two, the other weather elements, that is ongoing as well. So we were um, we we're on a little bit of crunch over here to also produce the oceanic winds for version two. So there, there's a lot happening. So um, so we met with the folks at OPC, Joe, and, and the rest, and basically a couple outcomes came out of that meeting. One is they didn't want a straight out deterministic blend wind speed grid. Um, because they focus on, on cyclone location and things like that, and that might not be as well depicted in there when you start blending models. Uh, wind direction is a whole is a whole separate <coughs> issue, which I, which will be addressed at some later point. So uh, what we thought of is following basically the paradigm of facets that we could come up with some sort of probabilistic hazards index for days four through seven. Um, and this product would then provide forecast uncertainty information to highlight some possible hazardous high wind events. So this, again, is not necessarily the end point or the end, yet, but this will, this was a starting point to get something going that would be useful to folks. So, so the basic methodology is um, where we would just level, leverage the, the global models. Obviously, you can't leverage the local ones. Uh, GFS, GFS, CMCE. Uh, for their wind speed forecasts, and this would all be on a 10-kilometer grid for both those large uh, oceanic, uh, Atlantic and Pacific basins. So the basic idea is 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 really simple, uh, is really to calibrate each model's forecast using the 13-kilometer GDAS analysis, which would be downscale to 10, um, and the because though that model. From what I understand, is only every or is every six hours. We would have to interpolate three hourly because our forecasts are three hourly. So I asked Joe, and he said that that was fine to do. Um, so the what essentially what we're doing is is using what we've been doing in version one and 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 version and obviously for the other elements in version two is simply a uh, simple bias correction methodology, uh, the exponentially weighted moving. Average. Uh, we apply this to temperature and other 
and other weather elements. Now, while this is, this is linear in nature and perhaps higher wind speeds may have some sort of different bias correction uh, equation, <coughs> but this was, uh, <coughs> most winds are not that high. Um, and for the most part, this would be a good starting point because this is, again, we're trying to fit something into the, and engineer it into what we already, some pre-existing structure that we already have, again, because we needed to get this out in a, in a rather quick uh, manner. So this, so this bias correction is performed separately for each grid point and each projection. And once you get this, um, this B sub T or bias delta, whatever you want to call it, you just subtract it from the forecast at those respective grid points and projections. So, um, so again, as I said, we're doing this in the national blend of models for the regular winds over the uh, the CONUS, Alaska, Puerto Rico, I. And um, so we end up, and we apply this to the deterministic uh, GFS and the, um, the ensemble members and mean inputs. Now, we're not applying it to every ensemble member. We just chose the first 10. Um, and so I suppose we could have gone further, but we weren't sure of the processing time that it would have necessarily taken it. And we've also found from um, EKD MOS that usually the first 10 members, uh, they do an, an adequate job in, in representing the spread and uncertainty. So obviously more is better, but sometimes you need to balance things out. Um, so essentially um, what we end up then doing is we take each bias corrected input, they're pulled together and generate a CDF, a cumulative density function, and then where, whereby we can uh, pluck off any wind, wind speed exceedance values, um, but generally the 10, 25th 50 to 75th and 90% are usually of most interest. Um, and the MAE weighting steps that we normally do in winds and other things are really not applicable here. I just wanted to point that out. So I'm just going to run through a few little slides over here that Yoon uh, prepared for a case. This was, uh, I guess, back in April uh, when we were doing this. And these are just the different percentiles um, for the six-hour projection so you can see the, 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 uh, the threat. And I'll just step through that. That was the, the 10th. Uh, this is the 25th and the 50th, 75th, and 90th percentile. So you can, you can see the hazards as you, as you go up there. Just pretty, pretty neat. Um, so essentially the product is what I've just showed you, wind speed forecast for these exceedance values at three hourly resolution, beginning at the six hour horizon, extending to uh, 192 at those at temporal resolutions, and then six hours thereafter through 264. Um, if you want to call a deterministic wind speed forecast, which again OPC was not interested in, but you can call the 50th exceedance forecast the deterministic. Uh, the, the, and what we've also supplied, and this wasn't mandated, and this is nothing to do directly with the blend, but we figured if we're going to package up these wind speeds, it would also be good to package up the GEFS and CMCE mean wind direction so they could overlay that over this product and for, for whatever purposes they might need. So we just offer that information so they could bring it up quickly. Um, and obviously there's no blend with the wind directions there. Uh, so blended percentile wind speeds, GFS, CMC, wind direction, okay. They'll be placed on a 10 kilometer Mercator grid in grid two format. So again, everything's on 10 kilometers, same projection. So they're looking at the it's apples to apples. Uh, the NBM oceanic percentile wind seas forecast and non-blended GEFS CMC direction forecast, and they'll live on W coast uh, in grid two files. And as David mentioned, in the next coming weeks, one or two weeks, we hope to have the oceanic viewer coming so we can we can interrogate this product further. OPC has not had a chance really to look at this yet and, and really give us uh, feedback, good or bad, on its performance. Uh, again, this kind of came out towards the summertime where things are relatively benign, except in the tropics. Um, and we really hadn't had the viewer to really look at this product yet. Um, so that'll, and we'll, there'll also be verification coming along with this uh, against the, the GDAS. So, <coughs> I guess with that, are there any other any questions? So, hopefully, be able to answer them. Will this approach make the starting point of version three probably a fixed version of the NPM? Say that again. 
Is this approach to to this probability of exceedance becoming a starting point for the version three? Yeah, we would work from this. Good. So, um, how do you deal with the lack of OBS in the ocean? Is that big problem? Oh, we're just we're just using the GDAS grid as as the observation. True. Okay. No, no actual OBS. Thank you. Thanks. If there Thank aren't you. any more questions, I would like us to move on to Tom's presentation because he has quite a bit of material that I know a lot of folks are interested in hearing about. So Slide if we could move on to Tom Hamill's presentation. Sure. So you've decided to sleep tonight? <laughs> yeah. Dave? Uh, Dave? So you decided to sleep tonight? Hey, turn it on. <laughs> turn it on. Still thinking about it. Great. Screen. Screen. Okay, Tom, do you see the share screen? I do. I've just clicked on it. Uh, let's see. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Go to full screen here. Um, so this will be a report out on blend version 2.1 for POP and QPF. Now, practically, this is also a report on 2.0 because you haven't heard much details on either. And the changes between 2.1 and 2.0 are at a pretty minor level in terms of algorithmic changes. So they do have some positive impact on the, on the overall results. <laughs> And as we get to the where those changes are, I'll, I'll point them out. Uh, I think actually this is hopefully going into operations uh, more like January 2017. Is that correct, Dave? The latest schedule is January. Okay. So POP 12 is 12-hour 12 POP, QPF 06, 6-hour six QPF. I think you're all familiar with this. Um, Louis has been a big advocate of the national blend in part to help us achieve more consistency between WFOs by providing a national generated product, which hopefully is of such high quality that forecasters will feel like less manual intervention is needed. Hey, Tom, so, uh, this is Andrew here real quick. Sorry to interrupt. Um, are you displaying the slide deck? It, you may have frozen here uh, locally on the, on the, uh, on the uh, GTM. Huh. Okay. I'm on slide two, and you're not seeing slide two? Do you have the right? So you may not have Okay, I didn't hear that background information. Do we? Uh, we just have you as selected on the. Uh, all I see your desktop is uh, the kind of the the PowerPoint. It's not in presentation mode, and it's selected on the cover page. Uh, how about we go back to you presenting? Sure, I can do that. That might be easier. And then just tell me when you want to switch. Yeah. I'll go up here. OK, let's go to slide two. <coughs> OK, so this was just a cartoon illustration uh, that I think you, if you pick any day, any time, you'd see something similar that shows some of the inconsistencies between what the weather forecast office is of the type that we're hoping to remedy by having a very good national product for for POP and QPF. In terms of the division of labor on this project, uh, Ezreal PSD has taken the lead on the precipitation-related elements, including type and snowfall amount that we're working on now. And MDL has, of course, provided very capable <coughs> management and are developing temperature and wind products and have been actively involved in porting our code to operations. More on that later. Next slide. OK, I had done some previous work on multi-model POPs. This is an article, uh, an illustration from an article that I wrote back in 2012, which shows that a combination of ECMWF, Met Office, Canadian Center, and NCEP data, just alone without any modification, provided quite reliable POPs, even out here at day five for the forecast lead. Um, now. Why can't we just plug in that multi-model pop in the national blend? 
first consideration is that ECMWF and Met Office data is not available to us currently. Um, I understand that they are willing to share um, if we could work out a payment agreement, but we're not willing to pay. Um, so that's unfortunate, but understandable. Um, another challenge is that in the National Blend of Models, we're looking at two and a half kilometer gridded data, not the one degree, much coarser resolution that was done in this previous study. And so we can't expect those global models to be providing that <coughs> spatial resolution just yet. Next slide. So we faced a number of challenges um, in generating a blend pop and QPF. And I'd like to go through some of these and then we'll go into the algorithmic solutions for these. One thing that we're wrestling with is frequent model changes. We're not yet to the point of having reforecasts, so we're headed in that direction. As a consequence, um, we have to practically, for this version of the blend, post-process using only recent forecast data. And I'll show you an illustration of why that's challenging in the coming slides. Another challenge is that uh, we often see, when we look at these multi-model POP products, that we've over-forecast light precipitation uh, quite extensively. Fixing the model is a very difficult thing to do because it ends up being related to parameterizations um, that you know, are really get you into the very details of the, of the forecast model. This is one thing that is amenable to fixing through statistical post-processing, um, thankfully. In terms of providing high-resolution details, including terrain-related detail, well, um, dynamical downscaling, as in using a high-resolution model, is one obvious solution. And in future versions of the blend, we indeed hope to incorporate the high-res rapid refresh information. Uh, but that does leave us with a challenge for longer lead forecasts. Um, and there we rely on statistical downscaling. So even though the forecast model is providing coarse resolution data, if there is high resolution analyses, which we're training against that have high resolution um, spatial detail, we can reinsert that through the statistical post-processing. Another challenge that we face particular here where we have only Met Office and ECMWF, or excuse me, uh, NCEP, and ECM, NCEP and Canadian data right now, uh, is that the model uncertainties that we would hope to be able to simulate through the use of a multi-model ensemble are not well simulated with only two prediction systems. Well, we could increase the number of systems with the high-res rapid refresh and the others. Uh, we could improve the existing ensemble prediction systems, and indeed we are, but this is a slow and difficult, challenging process. Or we could add elements to the way in which we statistically post-process to broaden the range of the forecasts, and that will be what we will uh, do in the national blend here. Now moving to a problem specific to QPF here, one of the things that we notice is that the deterministic forecasts from the ensemble mean tend to smooth out the amplitudes of the forecast maxima. And they, therefore, don't really give you a sense of the potential um, expected amount in a high impact event. I would like to hope that in the long run, we're more thinking probabilistically than deterministically, though it is understandable that you know, we continue to use deterministic prediction products because they're very understandable to our customers. Uh, but we can also develop post-processing processing methodologies that are able to restore some of that amplitude, and we'll be doing that in the national blend. Next slide. Okay, here is one of the, uh, just a sort of a cartoon illustration of the problem that we face with short training sample sizes. Out here in the western United States, this is the sort of thing that you might see in the fall. Uh, we have fairly dry falls, but then occasionally in comes a very significant weather system. And if we're asked to train with the recent forecast data, there may be nothing in that past set of forecasts that looks like the current forecast. And you really need samples that resemble today's forecast in order to make an intelligent correction, because biases or 
precipitation really depend upon the precipitation amount. Next slide. So the first thing that you might think about doing is to supplement the data using information from nearby grid points. So let's say that we're interested in the point on the left on the Oregon-California border near the coast. And I'm illustrating analyzed and forecast CDFs here. At that grid point, you can see the forecast CDF shows you this uh, cumulative probability distribution. So for example, at 15 millimeters in the forecast, um, that's at roughly the 82nd percentile of the distribution. That 82nd percentile of the distribution is more like 25 millimeters um, in the analyzed data. So the forecast is dry, is overly dry at that grid point. Well, if we were to munch together the training data together with the grid point on the right a little further inland, there the forecast is actually too wet. So putting the two pieces of data together will not result in an intelligent bias correction for either of them. They sort of average out. So even though we would like to supplement the training data using other locations, because we're using a, a short time series of past forecasts, we're going to have to do this in a more intelligent way. Next slide. Now this is understandably busy, and I'm not going to dig into the details, but you can go back and review it later. The idea here is that we're going to use supplemental locations, but we're going to do this more carefully. And we're going to choose locations which have similar terrain features and similar precipitation climatologies. And we'll also choose locations which are not too close together to each other because we don't want to have highly dependent data where they're both affected with similar biases by the same storm events. Next slide. So we look for similarity of terrain elevation as one matching criteria. And that's the terrain elevation data set that we use here. Next slide. <coughs> and at three different levels of scaling, we're going to look at a similarity of terrain facets. So here, the dark green color, for example, is uh, a slope of the terrain which is facing to the west-southwest. And if we're at a grid point in the San Joaquin Valley of California um, and we're looking for supplemental locations there, we would be looking, if possible, to find other points that are green that have similar terrain facets there with the assumption that the forecast bias is going to be similar depending upon terrain slope there. Now, we do this for different levels of smoothing. If you go to the next slide, we smooth the terrain somewhat and recalculate that terrain facet and do this again in the next slide for a yet coarser smoothing. And so we're interested in finding a terrain facet that is um, ideally the same at different levels of smoothing uh, because the model may have a relatively smooth representation of the terrain. Okay, next slide. So when you build all these factors together with a climatology, and here I'm showing you the 95th percentile of climatology for January, um, you end up with a set of supplemental locations. And depending upon the location, we may have as few as 50 if um, it's hard to find supplemental locations, and as many as 100 if it's easy. Take a look at Portland, which is that inverted triangle um, in the northwest. The big dot is over Portland. The smaller dots are the chosen supplemental locations, which have been found to have rather similar precipitation climatologies and terrain characteristics. So when we are training on Portland, Oregon, we're using the data not just at Portland, but from these other locations to account for the training sample size deficiency of, of using only the last 60 days of data. And you can see other locations. Phoenix is illustrated in the, the square there. And the colors, the, the sort of the gray shading, tells you something about the closeness of fit. The, the dark black ones are ones which are really quite 
close in their climatology and terrain characteristics to Phoenix. The lighter colored ones are ones that are uh, a somewhat poorer match. And I show you also Boulder, Colorado in the Pentagon, Omaha, Nebraska in the Star, Cincinnati um, also with the Triangle, New York City. And um, so you give you get a sense here of the supplemental locations. Now these are done for every eighth degree grid point all across the CONUS, actually, though I don't have the ability to show you all of those, of course. Next slide. At the very heart of what we are going to be doing in both POP and QPF is a technique called quantile mapping. Now we talk about bias correction a lot in uh, statistical post-processing. And bias correction for temperature, rather, even if you're rather warm or cold in the forecast, often there's a lot of information in the unconditional bias. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's warm or cold, the bias often is rather similar. That isn't the case for precipitation. Quite frequently, we'll have a different bias for high precipitation events than we have for low precipitation events. So we use these cumulative distribution functions to bias correct depending upon the amount. So for example, in the illustration here, the forecast CDF associated with 7 millimeters, it's roughly at the 91st percentile of the distribution. We look across and we see the 95th or the 91st percentile of the observed distribution is at more like uh, roughly 5.6 millimeters. So that raw forecast gets mapped from its original 7 millimeters to 5.6 millimeters. Well, what could go wrong in a process like this? In our case, one of the assumptions that we've made is that the biases from the last 60 days of data are reflective of the current biases. That's about the best we can do with the limited training data that we have. Now, we are likely to have some issues as we change from warm to cool season. In the warm season, we're more affected by biases that could be related to convective parameterizations. In the cool season, not so much. Um, so we could be getting somewhat incorrect bias corrections, especially in the changeover from warm to cool and cool to warm. <clears throat> Next slide. So on top of that basic quantile mapping procedure, we're going to add a couple more things to improve the forecast skill. One thing that we'll do is to not just use the data at our particular grid point, but to also use some surrounding grid points. I'll go into that in the following slides. And we will also incorporate stochastic quantile mapping. And I'll go into that also. Next slide. Okay, so uh, in the very top uh, panel of this multi-panel figure, I'm showing you nine dots here. Let's say that we're interested in post-processing at that most central dot. For each of those nine dots, I'm showing you the cumulative distribution functions in the nine panels here. Let's consider the center column B, E, and H. In uh, panel B at that northernmost grid point, we have an over-forecasting bias. In the middle grid point, the grid point that we're processing right now, um, we have a slight under-forecasting bias, and then that's even greater in panel H um, at the southernmost grid point in the center. So as we're processing grid point E, we're actually going to pull in the forecasts from these nine grid points. But we're going to use the forecast distributions that are illustrated in red from each of the panels but we're going to map it to the analyzed distribution only in panel E at the center. In this way, we're always correcting each of the forecasts to the climatology appropriate at that central grid point here. Um, and in this way, we're doing a couple desirable things. We're enlarging the sample size to minimize some sample size related variability. We're making sure that that larger set of ensemble members are consistent with the climatology at that central grid point. And if you think about it, um, you're going to be, through this procedure, getting a different sort of pop forecast when you have scattered precipitation and where you have a more uniform shield of precipitation. Where you have scattered precipitation, um, <coughs> even if you had a um, high 
precipitation amounts at that central grid point, if it's surrounded by ones with lower precipitation amounts, that spatial variability is going to knock down your, some of your ensemble members used to calculate the pop, and uh, you'll decrease the probability of precipitation. If you have a big sh uniform shield of precipitation, then that spatial consistency results in all of the ensemble members typically exceeding the pop threshold, and you have higher pops. Next slide. Another thing that's desirable here, um, and, and sort of implicit, is if the forecast data that you're using is coarser resolution than the analysis data, then this whole procedure is providing a statistical downscaling. Um, so that is occurring sort of under the hood here. Is there a question? On, on the phone, unless you have a question, please uh, mute your phone. Okay, next slide. Another thing that we're doing to broaden the spread of the forecast is to do what we call stochastic quantile mapping. So if you look at the 20 millimeter, which is sort of um, the, the topmost curve there, with this forecast distribution, that forecast is too dry, and the 20 millimeter amount is mapped to something more like 24 millimeters in the analyzed in its mean. But we're going to actually make a random draw from a normal distribution centered on that quantile mapped mean value of 24, but with some spread to it. And that spread is larger for heavier precipitation amounts, uh, consistent with having more uncertainty associated with the heavier precip forecasts. So this ends up adding spread to the ensemble forecasts in a way that we can't that, that we're forced to do by having only a <coughs> number of systems in our multi-model ensemble. Um, one point here is that we made a change to using a normal distribution as opposed to a uniform distribution between blend 2.0 and 2.1. Um, and it provides a small improvement and, and reduces some of the bias in the forecast. Next slide. So here's where we are to date. So before you've generated, uh, you're in the process of generating today's forecast, you will have determined these supplemental locations for every model grid point. You'll have populated the CDFs using the latest uh, day where forecast and analyzed data is available. And then as soon as the new forecast comes in, you read all of those member forecasts in. You stochastically quant quantile map them. Uh, increasing the ensemble size ninefold by using a three by three array of data. And then you have a nine times greater ensemble. From that you just produce a pop from the relative frequency of exceeding that pop threshold, 0.4 millimeters. So if 50% are greater than 0.4 millimeters, 50% is your uh, guess at the pop. And before you disseminate that, you smooth the forecast. And that's the next slide. On the left is an unsmoothed forecast. On the right is smoothing. Now, in the Western United States, um, we may have some detail which is realistically related to the complex terrain of the Western United States. So we've designed a smoothing algorithm which applies more smoothing in flat terrain, less smoothing in um, the complicated terrain of the West. And so as you look at the differences between the left hand unsmoothed and the right hand smooth, you'll see that there is more smoothing, for example, in northeast Nebraska than there is in the high peaks of the Rockies in central and southwestern Colorado. Uh, so this is a sort of a snapshot of the final product that you get there on the right side. A smoothed pop. And let's actually go look at a couple cases and, and, and see some of the steps here. Next slide. Okay, uh, the top panels are the raw ensembles. So panel A on the left is the NSEP ensemble and its pop forecast. Center is the Canadian ensemble, and when you combine those two, you get uh, a multi-model ensemble pop. And let's focus on that area in the red, because that's where the most significant changes go on. The lower 
left-hand panel is the unsmoothed forecast. And let's compare that to the smoothed forecast. <coughs> that area in the ellipse, notice how the pops have been knocked down very significantly from that area in pink, which is 80% or so, to more areas of green, which are 40%. However, you still see some accentuation of the pops along the front of the Sierra Nevadas and in the high peaks of southern Utah, along the Wasatch Range, and in um, southwestern Colorado. So we have managed through this process to retain a fair amount of spatial detail, but knock down um, this overconfidence that we tend to see in the raw ensemble. Next slide. Even at a longer lead time here, under 44-hour forecasts, we do um, have less chance of having high probability of precipitation here. But um, the high peaks in the western United States still in this particular forecast scenario are having probabilities in 80% or more. Um, it's still relatively sharp at these long leads here. Um, now, there wasn't as much of a change as you can see, for example, in Ohio um, and uh, northwestern Pennsylvania from the raw ensemble in panel C to this final product in panel I there. Um, and that's because what you had there was a, a heavier precipitation shield. And so even after quantile mapping, that quantile mapping didn't end up having um, many ensemble members that were below the pop threshold. So that's sort of that broader shield of precipitation and the heavier amounts, um, there wasn't much of an effect um, <coughs> on tile mapping on the pop. OK, results. Next slide. I like to look at reliability diagrams when I'm looking at probability forecasts. And so up top is just the raw multimodal ensemble for different forecast lead times, and you see this overconfidence. So for example, on the left-hand upper panel, uh, a forecast of 80% is happening an observed amount of the time, something like 40% of the time, a pretty dramatic overconfidence in that high probability. So that's why in the previous slides when I talked about knocking down the pops in the western United States, that was probably a desirable thing. Looking down below that, you see the pop reliability um, for our post-process guidance relative to the 1 8 degree analyses um, that we're using. And there's a tremendous improvement in the reliability, though that reliability is, is not absolutely perfect. And as you can see, a very substantial jump in the Briar skill score. And as you look at the other lead times going out to the different columns okay. further to the right, um, you see at all lead times, we're substantially improving upon the skill of the forecast and the reliability of the forecast. While there is some concern about the high end reliability, note from that inset frequency of usage histogram that we're not issuing those forecasts nearly as often as we are issuing the probabilities of, let's say, 60% and below. Um, so. Um, by and large, the POPs are fairly reliable over most of the times in which we issue them. Next slide. So now let's go on to deterministic uh, forecasting. And, and we're almost done here. Um, I'm showing you in the top panel here a synthetic ensemble member. So what you might see if you look along a latitude circle of ensemble members of precipitation forecasts in the individual colors. And then that dashed line is the ensemble mean. And you notice a couple features about that ensemble mean. Because of the diversity of positions, the maxima is lower than any of the individual ensemble members. This becomes more and more of a case as you get out to longer forecast leads and there's greater diversity of positions. The second thing is the distribution is somewhat broader than the individual ensemble members. So when you actually build up a CDF of that ensemble mean and a CDF of the analyzed data, that's something you'd probably see something with a characteristic like what's shown in the bottom panel here. <coughs> so the ensemble mean forecast 
We'll start off with very few forecasts that are zero, 20% in this case, where it's more like 50% in the analyzed. As a consequence of this, if we do a quantile mapping here, a deterministic quantile mapping, there's going to be a lot of light precipitation events that get mapped back to zero precipitation. And then on the other hand, if we're looking at a 5 millimeter forecast here, that 5 millimeters is maybe at the um, 97th percentile of the distribution, and that associated 97th percentile of the analyzed distribution is um, perhaps uh, 8 or 9 millimeters, a substantially larger amount. So the high amounts are going to be mapped, the high forecast amounts get mapped to yet higher um, analyzed amounts, increasing the maxima through this quantile mapping procedure. Next slide. So let's look at an actual forecast example here. The raw ensemble mean for a short range forecast here, 30 to 36 hours, is shown in that upper left panel. After the quantile mapping, looking in central Virginia, you see the um, increase in the maximum amount there. And you also see a drying, for example, in Michigan and Ohio here. Um, and comparing that against the analysis, you see some things that look reasonably good, that drying out was appropriate in Michigan, though probably not appropriate in this particular instance in Ohio. But the, the maxima in the Carolinas and the Virginia do seem to match up better with the observed maxima. Next slide. As we go to another case for a longer lead forecast here, looking at panel A, that raw ensemble mean, and looking at Arkansas, you can see a pretty dramatic increase in the ensemble mean amounts after that quantile mapping, and that persists even after smoothing here. And though the position is wrong, as you probably have been conditioned to expect for the really long lead forecast here, um, at least that maxima is closer to the maxima that was observed in Mississippi which is maybe 40, 50 millimeters. We at least got it up into the um, 20 to 40 millimeter range after the quantile mapping, as opposed, as opposed to that raw ensemble in panel A having a maximum around, um, what is that, um, 10 to 15 millimeters. Next slide. So some verification scores here, um, equitable threat scores and post-processed guidance are improved somewhat through this methodology. That's shown in the blue relative to the raw multi-model ensemble in the red. And notably, the biases are improved rather substantially here. Um, at the low precip amounts, the bias is almost uh, the desirable amount of 1.0. It's still slightly under forecasts. Um, I would note that one of the changes between blend 2.0 and 2.1 was addressing uh, this bias issue. In blend 2.0, we had a, a challenge of not having precipitation amounts that were um, high enough at the high end because we didn't trust our quantile mapping, and we adjusted that in blend 2.0. Hey, Tom, Tom, what's your sample size for this analysis? Um, sorry for not stating that earlier. This is April through June of this year, okay. so uh, roughly 90 days. Thanks. Over the CONUS. Next slide. So finishing up here. Uh, we have an algorithm. 2.0 is pretty good. 2.1 is a little bit better. That provides uh, QPF and POP 12 guidance that we hope does meet a lot of the criteria that's needed for the national blend. Now, that's not to say that it's perfect. Obviously, we could and hope to bring in more models to the system, and to move from a more ad hoc tuning that we have done so far to a more systematic, statistically rigorous method of tuning some of the parameters in the system, as well as comparing against other established methodologies, such as that of my colleague, Michael Scheurer. Uh, as we develop verification data sets beyond the CONUS, leveraging things like a Canadian precipitation data set, and satellite-derived precipitation data sets out over um, beyond the CONUS, then we'll extend the procedure beyond the CONUS, working with MDL. 
In terms of my concerns, um, I would note that, and this is uh, something that MDL is very aware of, the old infrastructure that MDL has for doing this is really um, hard for us in the research community to use. And they know this, and they're developing WISPs, a Weather Information Statistical Post-Processing System, effectively a code rejiggering of the post-processing that makes it more amenable to community usage. We're big supporters of that because we had a tremendous amount of work to do and code handoff from us and Ezreal to our colleagues at MDL. Finally, if you have a chance to put in a plug for doing the longer re longer term research on post-processing. For example, working on long lead uh, severe weather forecasts, things that are really sort of difficult problems. Well, those are the ones that OAR is supposed to be chewing on, but there really isn't a funding stream for that activity. And if you have a chance to be an advocate for that and you want those products in the pipeline several years hence, we need to be working on those in OAR right now. And so your advocacy would be very much appreciated. With that, I'll finish. Thank you for your attention, and sorry for going a little bit long. Thanks, Tom. Questions? Yeah, Tom, I noticed on slide nine you, you made reference to um, a lot of this was motivated um, yeah. by Chris Daly and his PRISM. And I'm wondering, to, uh, to what degree you know, have you utilized, advanced, um, moved things on from where they were because they, you know, they did quite a bit of research on this, and it's, it's quite broadly used. So I'm just wondering what the overlap is, or what you've added. In this case, the particular aspect that I used of their work was to use this terrain facet. I used their oh, algorithm, okay, okay. which I just coded up directly. But I haven't done any of the other sort of uh, let's say, uh, what do we call it, sort of weighted least squares approach that they use in terms of a regression approach to blend in other locations. Uh, so really the methodology is, is adapted to the problem at hand of being effective POPs. Chris Daly is interested in a deterministic precipitation climatology, and so, you know, they're somewhat different problems. So. I borrowed some of the technologies where I thought they were appropriate, but not all of them. Uh, okay, yeah, that's yeah, because their work, a lot of it was, you know, dealing with multi-decadal uh, climatologies to try to get a better handle on that. But I, I can see borrowing some of that makes a lot of sense, looking at the shorter time scales. So, and the models certainly change over less than thirty years. So. Uh, I didn't get to an acknowledgments page. I acknowledge very much the uh, consultations with Chris Daly, but I also forgot to put uh, Jeff Craven as one of the people that um, were tremendously helpful in this process here. Um, Jeff did a lot of looking, and his staff did a lot of looking at these precipitation forecasts and providing us with very useful feedback that helped us improve it substantially along the way. So thank you very much, Jeff. Great. Hey, Tom, uh, Dave Novak here, Weather Prediction Center. Uh, you know, really impressive uh, work here. And I know, you know, we had some in early interaction and uh, collaboration on this. Um, just want to note, uh, NGGPS, some funded projects there, we did work on some dynamical downscaling approaches. So we have some work that we could probably collaborate there. Uh, we also had some NGGPS work uh, funded on bias correction of CPF that we should probably uh, be talking about together. Uh, you know, so, and the, and the last point I think is we are pulling this data in now at WPC, at least the version 2. Is the version 2.1 being generated in a operational, in a kind of semi-operational way? Uh, Dave, do you want to answer that? We're a couple of weeks away from running that routinely. We're finishing up the development for that. Okay. We'll, we'll make those group files available to you when they're, they're going regularly. Great. Thanks. Any other questions in the room or on the phone? Uh, and th this is Jeff, and thanks for the plug, Tom. And as a matter of fact, on the National Blend of Models outreach folder, and I, I think there's about 100 people that have access to this, 
There are 17 presentations if you want to look at some of the POP and QPF results for some recent high impact events. Uh, there's quite a few there, but yes, it's it, it's it's pretty impressive, and so we're looking forward to 2.1 and more. But it, it's already very impressive work. So thank you, Tom. You're very welcome. Anything else? Final thoughts? All right. Just want to thank everybody for the presentations, and I want to thank everybody for the comments and the the interactions. Uh, you know, these are very important upgrades that we have uh, in the pipeline here, and you know, it's a big part of our enterprise. You know, these things weren't around too long ago. Being anything? Good. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you.